Buenas noches, todo. Bienvenidos a Neurosurgical TV. Déjeme introducir a hostess Flor. Flor, está allá. Doctor Bennett, buenas noches, sí estoy. Ok. Ok, Flor, tú tienes, tienes ocho minutos. ¿Te hace comedia o canciones o algo? Está bien, doctor. ¿Quiere cantar Marinero? ¿Qué tipo de canciones conoce? Eh, <laughs> de todo un poco, doctor. Un poco, ok. Sí, doctor. Pues yo, yo, no, yo no puedo cantar. <clears throat> ok, tenemos uh, siete minutos, ¿no? Listo, doctor. ¿Tú conoces uh, Sal Salim? Todavía okay. no, doctor. Todavía ok, okay. So, ok. Busca su... ¿Dónde trabaja? Ah, no, dónde sí, sé, sí sé dónde, dónde trabaja el doctor Salim, doctor. Sí, sí. Lo, Muy gracias, sí. Solamente pocos cosas. ¿Quién, quién es? Buenas noches con todos. John, Flor, buenas, buenas noches. Bar. ¿Cómo bien, están? Bien. Bien, buenas noches. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo está? Bien, bien. ¿Todo bien ustedes? ¿Qué tal? Todo tranquilo, doctor. Menos mal. Eh, Flor, Estamos sí, por favor, pondrásme de, de, de co-host para poder eh, añadir y cambiar a panelistas a... Hello. Doctor, si no me equivoco, el doctor Bennett la tiene que poner como co-host porque yo no puedo. Solo yo puedo ascender a panelistas, me parece. A ver, de un momento. ¿Quién tiene el pelo? ¿Quién tiene el pelo? ¿Es el Byron o el Flor? Hola, John. Hola, ¿quién tiene el, el pelo? Yo puedo oír un pelo. No, no lo entiendo. No, ok, ok, tal vez un poquito. Okay. Doctor Bennett, si ¿sí puede poner al doctor Byron como, como co-host, por favor. Ok. Sí, Byron, tú puedes entrar alguien durante, durante la charla. Sí, perfecto. Sí, sí con sí, eso sí, ahí voy viendo y vamos sonando, incluyendo. No sé si ya le han visto al profesor Salim y al profesor Ay Aquí, el profesor Salim está aquí. Salim conoce, él hace mucho, yo creo. Sí, Mauricio, Mauricio está allá. Creo que sí. Mauricio. ¿Es Natalie un, un miembro de uh, Flor? Natalie? Sí, doctor. Natalie es una de las. Ok, yo voy a ser cojo también. Hola, Mauricio. Hi, doctor. Good evening. ¿Tú conoces cómo entra la gente? Uh, are you Mauricio. Yeah, yeah. Tú, tú, ok. De vez en cuando, mira allá. Buenas noches, uh, doctor. Buenas noches, doctor. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, bien, John. Ok, la que me saca mi estrés. ¿Cómo te llama esta montaña? Se llama Cotopaxi. Ah, es famoso, ¿eh? Es un volcán, sí, muy conocido. Muy conocido. Y de vez es en la... cuando echa un poco de humo. Oh, sí, humo, nada sí. más. Solo humo, nada más. Nada más, espero. Sí, la última erupción fue hace 500 años. Oh, wow. Uh, sí, Nicaragua tiene mucho volcanes también. Uh -huh. Nicaragua, uh, no sé si Honduras tiene, pero Nicaragua sí, lo he visto.
Profesor Salim ya está aquí. Como no, panelista. Estaba, no, llega. no, ya no. estaba como, como atendí. Él usa WhatsApp o uh, Facebook. Sí, sí, ya le, ya le escribí. Oh, ok, él conoce, ¿verdad? Sí, sí, claro. Ok. Sí, está como panelista. Está. ¿Y qué quiere hacer, uh, Byron? ¿Flor introduce a Salim o tú quieres introducir a Salim? Sí, eh, eh, yo creo que como siempre, ¿no? Flor nos da la bienvenida, me introduce a mí. Ok. Y, okay, me... y ahí comienzo yo. Ok. okay. Perfecto. Y ahí hago las introducciones. Hello. Hello, Salim. Professor Salim. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see Hi, you. How are you? Hi, nice right, to, to have you with us. Hi, doctor. Good. Good. I'm trying to see how to turn on my video here. Okay, Flo, move, move, mueva su camera. Tú es muy alto su camera. Flo. Su, puede bajar su, su camera. No puede. Se corta su cabeza. Ok, sí, sí, Ma, más, poco más, por favor. Es muy bajo, muy, poco más. No puedo ver su cabeza. Ma, más, no puedo. Eh, no, doctor, es que se cae mi laptop. Oh, oh ok, está bien. Uh, no puedo regalar, no es en gran cosa. Buenas noches, Natalie. Buenas noches, doctor. Bienvenidos. ¿De dónde eres, Natalie? Uh, John, I'm, John, I'm not getting the video signal here. Uh, well, let me let me check on you to see if your camera's even connected. <clears throat> okay, hold on, let me. You're in the in the panel, right? I don't see the panel. Uh, see the chat. Jeez, I don't even see. <laughs> I don't even see you on the panel. Either yeah. the panel. Either the panel or, the, or the, this is this is rare. Doctor Bennett, Doctor Bennett, I think he's just allowed to talk because he mm, he doesn't you, appear here as a panelist. Can you add me? Or how does that work? I don't see. Uh, can you log out and come back in, please? Yeah, let me log out. Let me log yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That usually works. <clears throat> <clears throat> now okay oh there you go there, there you go. go there you go a purple coat wow <laughs> bienvenido doctor juan luis gómez amador que gusto doctor me parece que está con el micro apagado Buenas noches, doctor Salazar. Nice to see you, Professor Abdul Rauf. Professor Abdul Rauf. Oh, so good to see you, Juan. Uh, so good to see you. Oh, my God, yeah. Uh, so good to see all of you. Muchas gracias, doctor. Profesor, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Okay, Flo, are you ready? You guys ready? Okay, doctor. Tengo que hacer la presentación en inglés o en español. Uh, well, uh, depende. ¿Cómo quiere hacer, Byron? ¿Español para introducir? No, inglés, inglés. Sí, es que no tienes problema. Ok, claro, uh, español está bien, Flor, ¿ok? okay. ¿Español o inglés, doctor? No, español. Para, ok, tú, para okay. empezar. Es una tradición de canal. 
Okay. Ok, diez, nueve, ocho, siete, seis, cinco, cuatro, dos, uno. Muy buenas noches a todas las personas que nos siguen a través de las distintas plataformas de Neurosurgical TV. Mi nombre es Flor de María Ibáñez Loaiza y par formo parte del equipo estudiantil de Neurosurgical TV. En esta oportunidad tenemos otra vez un grato viernes con la Sociedad Ecuatoriana de Neurocirugía presentando el quinto curso de Educación Médica Continua, coordinado por el doctor Byron Salazar. Doctor Byron Salazar, adelante. Muchas gracias, Flor. Buenas noches con todos. Eh, permítanme hacer esta pequeña introducción en inglés debido a nuestros grandes panelistas. Um, good evening and good night for everybody. I would like to welcome you to our weekly continuous medical education webinar organized by the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery. I would like to thank you, uh, I would like to thank our scientific committee, our sponsors, the International University of Ecuador and the Metropolitan Hospital. Uh, I would like to thank John, Bennett and Neurosurgical TV for the broadcast of all our webinars, uh, to the Peruvian Student Society SOPIN and to all our viewers. We have today a special guest. Uh, let me introduce our moderators of tonight. We have Professor Ive Sherian. Uh, he's the director of Novel Institute of Neuroscience in Nepal. He's in charge of the ACNS educational courses and a WFNS member. And we have Dr. Jorge Salazar. He is the, uh, the director uh, of neurosurgery at the Metropolitan Hospital in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, please, uh, please uh, uh, let me give, give you the word to, the, to the, uh, Jorge, Salazar, Jorge Salazar, who will, who will our, guest, our guest tonight. Good evening. It is our pleasure to present Professor Salim Adurav, who is a world-known neurosurgeon. He is chief in the Institute of Neurosurgery and founding chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at St. Louis University, Missouri, USA. He is considered a living figure in the field of neurosurgery, and he has served as a visiting professor to over 100 universities around the globe. Dr. Abdul Rauf authored the main reference textbook for brain bypass surgery titled cerebral revascularization, in which he details extracranial to intracranial bypass surgery. I have this book signed by himself when we were in St. Louis at the first World Neurosurgery Congress of Bypass Surgery. He has pioneered in the procedure of brain bypass surgery that is named after him. He also has served in multiple boards of neurosurgical societies, including the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, North American School-Based Society, the World Federation of School-Based Societies. He has been the seventh president of Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. His most prominent role is his appointment in the inaugural global president of the Walter Dandy Neurosurgical Society which is considered an international society of operative neurosurgery. It is my pleasure, it's the pleasure of the Ecuadorian Society of Ecuador to present Professor Salim. It's all yours. Uh, Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Professor Salazar. It's my honor to be with you and for your very kind introduction. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of friends here. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Byron Salazar for uh, this uh, kind invitation to come to you to Ecuador. Uh, 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 Dr. Juan uh, Gomez, uh, professor in Mexico, friends for many years, I friends for many years, John Bennett doing such an amazing job on the world stage. So uh, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be with you here tonight. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and start. And if the panelists can give me, like, uh, I don't want to go over my time. So if you could give me uh, like a five minute uh, heads up when it's uh, done so I can really, uh, you know, uh, finish uh, the session. So I stick to time for sure. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go, go ahead and share a screen. So it's good to be here with you. And I'm going to talk to you today about um, 
uh, at least the lessons I have learned in the treatment of ABMs during my career. Uh, I'm going to talk to about a few things that I'm going to mention that I'm going to summarize them at the end. One of the things I've learned is the traditional <clears throat> idea is to take all large feeders early in surgery. I do not believe that's a good idea. And I'll tell you why. The... Um, When you're dealing with ABMs that have large feeders and then they have feeders coming in, these perforating vessels coming in deep, the problem is the traditional technique, the Yashigal technique, in which you, um, you essentially take all the large feeders early on, the deep feeders, the small feeders, get all the blood flow coming through them. So they get, become very active. By keeping a fee, the, some of the large feeders until late in surgery allows you to manipulate the feeding vessels, the deeper feeders, easier. So that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today. The second concept I want to talk to you about, as many of you know, I have looked at the issue of complications in ABMs, and I have uh, talked about in these some of these complex ABMs, for example, this is a motor strip AVM in the motor strip in a patient, uh, young lady uh, who has had the radio surgery. So this AVM, of course, we have to worry about the MCA feeders, but also the lenticulostriate feeders coming into it. So this becomes a high risk AVM because it's in the primary motor strip um, of the brain. So one of the things I have looked at is the potential of doing some of these surgeries awake to avoid the risk of complications. So let me show you how uh, I do this. Essentially, this is the uh, uh, AVM in the motor strip of the brain right here. Okay. Uh, and this is in a sagittal view, okay. Uh, coronal view. So essentially what I'm doing here, I'm talking to the patient as, I'm, as you see, uh, this patient, you know, there's been previous hemorrhage. So the arachnoid is very, uh, very stuck. Okay. And let me show you what the advantage is. So it's not the idea of just a benefit of awake, uh, meaning general anesthesia. That is not really the, the necessary advantage. The advantage is that can I test the main feeders in any suspicious vessels that may be bystander vessels that are supplying the primary motor area that I don't occlude them by mistake, which can happen in ABM surgery. On vacation, I'm stuck because there is... Okay, so this is an example here. The ABM is all here. There's this vessel right here. I am not 100% certain if this feeder is going to the AVM or is actually supplying part of the motor area, which would be not a feeder, but a normal vessel, but it's hard to tell within this, uh, uh, this card arachnoid here. So this is how I'm gonna test it. So I've got a temporary clip and I test the patient right away. Okay. This is a hundred percent test. If this is only a feeder to the AVM, it will supply no normal brain. If, however, it's supplying the motor cortex, I will know right away. And that's something not easily doable under general anesthesia with electrophysiological monitoring. So that's the advantage in ABM surgery of figuring out every single vessel, what, what it can do. And as we go deeper now, this is one of the deeper, either a feeder or lenticulostriate vessel going to the internal capsular area. How will I know 100% for sure? Well, by doing this right now, I put a temporary clip and then I'm going to test the patient. This is the 100% test. Because I'm dealing with the capsule area, I'm gonna test the arm and leg. And once I'm okay, then I can take it without any concern. So that is a pure advantage of doing what we're doing here. And of course, this is the rest of the surgery and resection of the AVM. The other lesson I have learned over the years to avoid partial treatments of AVMs. This has been an issue where I have had a number of patients that 
come to me for, uh, for after failed treatments. And I, this is a lesson I have learned. Let me show you an example. This is a patient who had an AV, she, at a young age when she was 11, 12 years old, an AVM in the uh, uh, cingulate gyrus was immediately. Uh, and it was, a, in my view, a very treatable AVM, okay? Uh, from a surgical resection standpoint. It was elected for her that she undergo embolization followed by radio surgery, okay? So over the years, she was followed, she had a second hemorrhage when she was um, 18 years old. And at that time, the AVM had become these very tiny little vessels, a little bit more difficult, but still completely resectable, okay? So she underwent uh, another episode of embolization uh, at that time. Now she comes to me at age 21 with a third hemorrhage in this area. Luckily, she was doing okay. Look at what happened to this AVM. Over the years, essentially 10 years follow, this AVM was all in the cingulate gyrus, resectable completely, a low-grade AVM. By multiple embolizations, followed by radiosurgery, what happens over the years is that the AVM is now recruiting feeders from a, a very difficult place. It's recruiting feeders from the P1 and the top of the basilar, the medial uh, lenticulostriate vessels uh, and the choroidal vessels. Uh, and it's now inside the velum interpositum. It was here before, completely treatable. Now it's a very high risk AVM with a third hemorrhage. So the lesson I have learned over the years, we have to treat AVMs uh, like uh, pregnancy. Either you're pregnant or not, so cure or not, there is no gray area in treatment of AVMs. Partial treatment may make, feel, may make uh, the doctor feel better, but that is not curing the AVM. So this is the lesson I've learned uh, in managing these patients. Now I'm stuck with a really bad situation, very difficult location in a young patient. So here I am inside the lateral ventricle, inside the trigone, okay? Entering the uh, vellum interpositum. Right here, these are those choroidal feeders coming in, the medial uh, choroidal feeders, medial posterior uh, choroidal feeders coming in. You have to be very careful. This is inside the trigone, okay? I'm checking at the lateral uh, choroidal feeders, posterior lateral, okay? Coming in, making sure that I get every feeder because this young lady has had too much in 10 years. I need to go for cure now. There is no more messing around with this AVM, okay? Once and for all, I have one shot at this. Now, this is a vein going to, uh, to the vein of Galen here, uh, inside now the, uh, in the posterior part of the vellum interpositum. And now I am uh, coagulating the last vein right here. And now I'm cutting the last vein right there, okay? That's the AVM that had eluded people for 10 years. She was treated in different parts of the United States and so forth over the years by well-meaning doctors, but I don't think that was the right strategy. Now I'm really uh, kind of exploring the whole area inside. I'm looking at the choroid plexus, make sure nothing is left. And that's normal plexus. I'm happy with it and I'm exploring it. This is a post-operative CT scan. This is a post-operative angiogram, immediately post-operative AP and lateral. That's a post-operative angiogram right there. That's her a few months later. So these are lessons I'm sharing with you uh, that I have learned uh, in the treatment of AVMs. And next, uh, I wanna share with you another lesson that I have learned, which is the importance of the main large draining vein in identifying the whole nidus of the AVM. You see, you can be fooled. This nidus is not sitting on the surface. You're not gonna see it when you come into surgery. It's all deeper. Okay, uh, these are the subcortical AVMs that sit deep and you cannot tell when you are looking at the surface very easily where the nidus is. Instead of doing a large opening into the cortical surface in eloquent areas, the simple lesson that I have learned is this. You come, you see the large draining vein. No reason to make a large cortical opening to find the nidus. 
all you do essentially is follow the large draining vein inside and follow that sulcus and not uh, and avoid the, the wanting to really open make a large opening in the cortex here because that could cause a lot of damage see all i'm doing here just following that vein inside it's going to lead me to the middle of the nidus okay Okay, next, how to handle these difficult choroidal feeders. Uh, this is another case of a, a young patient again with a motor strip ABM. Uh, she was sent to me from the country of Saudi Arabia. Uh, she, had, uh, she is also a university student who bled from this ABM. Uh, and, uh, and she underwent uh, radio surgery in her country. Then she had another severe headache about a year and a half later. Uh, and they then repeated the angiogram. They sent her to France for potentially for embolization. But the, uh, the, the, the excellent uh, doctor in Paris who was looking at this said, this is, I, I will not achieve cure of this AVM doing embolization. The reason is this, and he, he's totally right. See, the problem is, although the AVM is getting supplied to the middle, middle cerebral artery, the problem is these feeders coming from the posterior circulation, coming through the, uh, the uh, lateral choroidals into the ventricle, it is going to be very difficult to get all the way in here without hurting the internal capsule because a lot of these feeders are feeding the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So he was very smart. He said, no, 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 I'm not going inside this. This is a high risk situation. Okay, so this is a kind of a challenge that you receive sometime that is a little bit more difficult because of this situation right here. That's the second patient I've showed you now. See, this is a problem here. The problem is, okay, we have a number of problems here uh, from a surgical perspective, okay? What are the issues that we have to confront with? Well, uh, you know, so one, is Zenitis is sitting in the primary motor strip. Of course, that's a problem by itself. But that's not only the problem. The second is that we got these vessels coming from the, uh, as a feeder, coming from the posterior medial choroidals. So that's number two. This is a big problem, okay? Because you're dealing with these vessels. And number three, these vessels, by definition, have to go through the internal capsule. So you've got three issues. As a surgeon, I train my residents and fellows to really dissect the problem. Dissect it into what are the issues here? As a surgeon, what are you confronting? These are the three issues that will, can cause major problem for us in surgery. Not only this being in the motor strip, what can cause paralysis, any of these three variables can cause paralysis in the surgery. Without having an objective plan like this, we have high risk of complication. So this is our plan. We understand what the problem is, okay? So let's uh, see how we're gonna handle this. Now we got a problem in our hand, young patient, uh, you know, needs treatment because has failed uh, radio surgery, uh, has been declined for embolization of these vessels and she has bled. So this is not one of these cases, well, we could just let it be. The problem is, you know, that's a very high risk decision, okay? So now what are we gonna do? How are we gonna handle it? Okay, you see these vessels coming out of the ventral, all right? So that's really the issue here. Of course, we look at DTI and so forth uh, in looking at, again, similar situation. You see, this AVM is a little deeper. I come to the central sulcus. I'm gonna identify it, okay? And uh, I'm gonna open the central sulcus and follow the large vein again into the AVM, okay? Exactly the, 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 the second point I made in this presentation is how you follow these AVMs down in the subcortical area, okay? So I'm gonna use my vein as my guide in, in identifying the surgery, okay? Okay. Okay, so what are we gonna do? There are vessels here, you see, right next to right next to the primary motor area. I am not gonna feel comfortable coagulating some of these vessels until I know 100% for sure. How am I gonna know? You see, 
I know right away I can take that vessel because it is not supplying motor area and it's only supplying the AVM. There is no way in the world I could have gotten that answer under general anesthesia. I could have done EEG, SSCP, but still not, can you know for sure? That is the advantage that I'm showing here, okay? So now, same thing. As I'm dealing with these people, Peters, I'm testing everything before I take them until I know for sure. Okay. This is again. Okay. So that's the, the surgery there. Every vessel. Now I'm coagulating the last vein after I've taken all the. So one of the things I, I've, I've done over the years, when I come to the last vein, I don't take it. I hold the bipolar, close it, just for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. It is a great test. Once you close the bipolar and you, you think it's your last vein, if there is a problem, there is a feeder still remaining, it will start bleeding or the AVM will start swelling up. You stop right away. So before you take the last vein, hold it with your bipolar and just sit there for 30 to 60 seconds. If everything is quiet, nothing is happening, you're good. If anything starts changing while your bipolar is closing the last vein, do not close it. Go back and explore the AVM. There is a problem. Okay. So these are lessons I'm sharing with you from my experience. Now I'm good. I held it for a minute. No problem. I can close the last vein and I'm very happy. Okay. I'm very happy because I know the patient is neurologically okay every step of the way. And I'm taking the last, uh, last vein. Okay, so the, the combination of those things is what's making a difference for me here. And there I'm taking the last vein and that's the AVM resected right there. That's her post op day number seven in clinic uh, before she goes to the country. I was lecturing in the Gulf region, uh, you know, about a year after that surgery, she, her dad, her little brother and she, and she went on to finish university uh, and back to school and so forth in her country. Disconnect my computer. It's gonna die in a minute. Okay. Next, another challenge: how to handle AVMs that are over five centimeters in size. Now that is a huge problem, and rarely do we ever have to operate on these things. But uh, again, uh, this is a patient that <laughs> I have known my whole career. When I came out of my fellowship at Yale. I, uh, I met him early on. He had this massive AVM. Of course, I said, no way. This is non-operative. Leave it alone. You're fine. He was like 12, 13 years old with his mom and dad came to me. I said, okay, fine. I followed him for years. So my whole career revolved around, I mean, every year I would see him. We say hello. We, you know, I got to know him and his family. Fine. Every year you see him once, do not mess with this AVM. There is no reason in the world to do anything. Of course, no reason to do any partial treatments would be very dangerous, okay? So I'm happy I'm following him. And lo and behold, uh, he shows up with a bleed here, right there. He's admitted to the ICU. He stays a week, has a ventriculostomy, starts waking up. Now the decision-making is very different. A young kid, 20 years old, with a bleed from an AVM, of course, and it comes to the pulvinar. Now we're stuck in a bad situation, okay? Now it's very hard uh, to not do anything. And to be honest with you, I would have never done this surgery. And luckily it happened at the time when I've already started, uh, introduced the concept of awake surgery for AVMs. Without awake, I don't know if I would have ever been able to do the surgery, I'll be honest with you, because there's so many areas. We got the motor area, we got the sensory area, we got the speech area and you got the vision. This AVM involves all of them, okay? So it comes to the, on the, on the left side, to the speech area. It comes posterior to the vision area. It comes uh, to the pulvinar and it comes to the capsular area high up, okay? All the way here. It comes up to the motor strip. So how are you gonna prevent a problem in a case like this? It's not easy, okay? So the only way I'm gonna know is by really examining everything for myself. So this is essentially in large AVMs like this, I really define the plane very well. 
And, uh, and I uh, really, uh, I have a, a very geometric understanding of the AVM. It cannot be a haphazard plan. It is a very specific plan, which plane I'm working in, what tests we're doing. For example, we're in the acceptable area here, we're testing his vision. As I'm testing any of the vessels I'm worried about. He likes dancing queen. Oh, don't think of that. He's operating. He's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a cool guy. You see? We're all cool guys. So, yeah. okay. Oh, see, I'm getting some bleeding from, uh, from this vein here. But that is not a problem. He, as an experienced vascular person, in, a, in a, a large AVM like this, you may get into some bleeding in certain parts of the AVM. It's okay. Here, the patient is awake. So we're calm and quiet and we're handling it, okay? What do you think of my vision so far? So he's asking about his vision because, uh, you know, amazingly enough, his vision was intact with this AVM. So we're testing his vision. Uh, every time we look at a feeder that we are not 100% sure about. There's some feeders you know 100%. Some feeders you cannot know 100%. The vision is okay so far. And for all, we take it, we had a lot of swelling and so forth in the brain. And I said, you know what? See, he's asking me again while I'm operating on him. What was the decision to operate on this AVM? You know, you know we had a lot of for all, we take, it, take care of it for you. But when you recently you just got admitted to the ICU, you know, you know, we had a lot of swelling and so forth in the brain. And I said, you know what? We just can't take any more chances. With right. You see, these are the large venous aneurysms that I'm taking care of. You have to take care I'm of them. I'm so glad we're just going to... Uh, well, you. you see, all the large venous There's aneurysms. Up to you. Uh, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I'm all yeah, the way down to the years. tentorium. All Thank the way down to the tentorium on the lateral side, okay? Of course, this was, you know, eight, nine hour surgery, but I'm just showing you a little bit of it. Anyway, so all the way around the AVM, around the plane, and that's him. Uh, post-op day number seven, post-op day clinic uh, visit. He's totally intact. Uh, and the reason we were able to preserve his, uh, his, uh, uh, his vision and motor function is because of those incremental lessons I have learned that I've shared with you, okay? Uh, so that's very important. Next, I want to share with you uh, thalamic AVMs. These are really a very specific problem that are very difficult and you don't want to operate on them unless you really have to. In general, for, for these deep-seated AVMs, the, uh, the, the, the answer should be no surgery until you're pushed to do surgery, okay? So this, for example, is a patient that presented to us, also a young patient, with a thalamic AVM that bled, and she was in the ICU for two weeks, ventriculostomies and everything else, and start waking up. Okay, uh, so this was a specific problem. That's uh, the AP, the lateral angiogram, again, the area of the velum interpositum, the posterior choroidals, the whole thing. Okay, now because she had bled already, it's, you know, radio surgery is not gonna help us in a young patient. Even if it's gonna work, it's gonna take two to three years. And the risk of rehemorrhage is very high. So I'm just gonna share with you here, the idea of how to, how to get in here based on the principles I just discussed with you, okay? So I'm getting around the AVM, same thing. Uh, not going through the cortical surface, going interhemispherically, same lessons we've talked about so far, okay? These are the posterior medial choroidals right here, okay? I'm identifying them, okay? And of course, I'm testing each one as I've showed you so far with the patient responding to me, okay? So I'm testing everything before I cut it. In this area, there is no room for any mistakes. Any normal vessel that size here would be a devastating injury. So there is no option of you know, guessing. I have to know 100%. There is really no options to just take a guess. Of course, this is the large vein of Galen aneurysm where the large draining vein is, and that's gonna be my last, uh, last uh, you know, part of the, the surgery. And so what am I doing here? Let me show you the same things I've showed you so far. I'm gonna repeat here. Same lessons. You see, the large draining vein in this case is the whole aneurysm. So I'm doing exactly what I showed you in the last case, uh, in the last cases. I'm gonna hold close the last draining vein, which happens to be the aneurysm, before I occlude it. Same 
exact principle. If I'm occluding this thing and something starts bleeding or starts swelling, I cannot occlude it. Something is still remaining. But my, by me occluding this, you see, I'm occluding completely, making sure that there is nothing left behind that can bleed on me at this point. And once I can make sure, you see, I'm holding it for a minute, then I'm going to put my clip across the aneurysm, which is the draining, the main draining uh, apparatus of this, uh, this ABM. I see right there, I'm going all the way to the ABM, making sure I don't occlude the actual vein of Galen, just the part of the aneurysm, which is the draining vein of this lesion. And there, I'm going to close it. Right there, okay? And now I can cut that and I can remove the, the whole structure right there. I put a couple clips just because it's so large. I didn't want to take any chances. And now I'm removing the whole ABM from the pulmonary. We didn't hurt any thalamus, normal thalamus, because we checked every feeder. We knew none of it was going to normal thalamus. Okay, that's the ABM. That's her a few months later. Okay, and she's back and finished college and everything. Now, the worst situation is in a brainstem ABM, the answer should always be no surgery. Uh, just by definition, I'm going to show you one case that pushed me towards a difficult decision. This is a patient. Again, you know, I've been, I have followed many of these patients throughout my career. This was one of them. He, uh, he had uh, hemorrhage before, even uh, when I was in my residency and uh, not, I was not in the same place. And he had this hemorrhage. He went to the East Coast of the United States. He had embolizations of this AVM and he had radio surgery. He was very young. Uh, and then uh, he had another hemorrhage. He had another course of embolization uh, on the key in New York City. Then in his 20s, he presents to me in the ICU with this hemorrhage. Okay. Very sick, ventriculostomies. He had already, uh, because of the ABM bleed, he, his baseline was facial uh, per, uh, paresis, sixth nerve uh, down on this side, uh, eighth nerve, no hearing on this side, but he still had good swallowing function. So he started to wake up uh, and started becoming alert. And at that time, I had a very difficult discussion with, uh, with his family, his parents, as to whether we, sh we could and should do anything, okay? Uh, and uh, finally, we said, well, he's had three bleeds. He's in his 20s. Everything has been done. Uh, he's going to die from this AVM. So we decided to proceed with this AVM. The problem with this AVM that it's supplying, getting supplied directly from the basilar artery through perforate. This is some of the worst feeders you'll ever find because it's not coming through big vessels. It's coming through feeders right off the basilar artery. You see, right there. and. Uh, this is a ICA coming all the way around and also supplying the AVM all the way around, okay? Well, there are a few things here that, uh, that we have to note that are going to be very important for us, okay? First of all, the whole nidus is inside the pons, okay? So this is not, you know, something you can dissect, uh, you know, in that way. Secondly, our biggest problem is, are these feeders are coming right off the basilar artery, okay? Thirdly, how are you gonna expose this whole area? I mean, how are you gonna see all the way around? This brings, of course, you cannot even consider do, doing this without a major skull base approach, okay? This is, otherwise you've got a disaster in your hand, okay? I mean, so there are a lot of complications with a case like this that you have to think through. So, of course, this is not a skull-based lecture, but uh, this is a case in which we do a total petrosectomy because he already has facial nerve and hearing nerve down. So I essentially have to expose that, and he has no hearing, so it allows me to go around the cochlea. That's for a different day. But anyway, you have to have that kind of approach. So what does that give you? Essentially, what that gives me is this. I have... Vertebral artery, 
vertebral artery, basilar artery, basilar artery. I have complete exposure of whole brain stem all the way around and all the way interiorly. With AVMs, you have to have that kind of exposure anyway, and in, in this area is very difficult. So that's what we have to have to be able to do this surgery. See, in this case, that's a sixth nerve here. I'm, I'm only taking the feeders as they enter the AVM, you know, and I've got a small bleeding from a vein right here. I'm only, I'm testing all the feeders, and this is at ICA. I'm only gonna take it where it's entering the nidus of the AVM. This is not like a cortical AVM where you could take it here or here. So, because there are tiny feeders from AICA that kind of go to the brainstem. So it's little lessons like that, that are so critical. Uh, so this is a whole basilar artery here, okay? This is these, one of the large feeders coming into the AVM. That's a draining vein right there in front of me, okay? This is a whole basilar artery exposed, okay? Right there, all right? So the fact that I can be testing these vessels, you see how this is again, the same principle applies. What are the principles that I have uh, worked with here, folks? Okay. One, I had the exposure. Without the exposure, there is no way of doing this surgery, okay? You have to have all this exposure. Three feeder, okay? Without testing, you cannot risk even a tiny vessel in this case, okay? Number three, I'm doing the same thing I did with the other cases. I'm holding the last vein, the big vein, for about a minute, closed without the bipolar on, just to watch what happens, just to watch what happens. And if everything is okay, then I'm fine. Believe me, if there's a feeler left, once you do this, within 10 seconds, the whole thing starts swelling or start bleeding. I know because I've seen it. Okay, so I want you to please, for the young uh, neurosurgeons, residents, to really learn some of these lessons that I have learned myself, okay? And uh, so this is what I'm doing here. Sitting there, no rush, just sit there tight, don't do anything. Once I'm happy, I'm gonna cut it, fine, okay? That's pre-op, post-op, pre-op lateral, post-op lateral, uh, okay. His picture, okay, this guy is friends with me on Facebook. He's always talking about his surgery. His picture is there for sure. Finally, I want to uh, share with you a summary of my outcomes of ABM surgery that was recently presented to the EANS by two of our students, uh, Soleil and Zena, and they presented our, uh, our outcomes. These are all the co-investigators uh, co of my outcomes of ABM surgery a large group of uh, students, residents, and neurosurgeons uh, that I want to acknowledge. Uh, and this is a presentation they gave. They looked at my total cases of ABMs that I've operated my whole career. We compared uh, my transition from uh, my teacher, Professor Yashville's technique to the points I just raised in this uh, presentation. Every point I raised with you in this presentation and how we are doing it slightly differently. So these were the two groups, okay? The two groups were very uh, comparable. If you look at the test group versus the control group, okay? Uh, the, 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 if anything, I mean, any reviewer would look at this and say, okay, if anything, there were more, uh, more uh, higher grade AVMs in, my, in the test group versus in the control group. Just, you know, just... Uh, and otherwise, things were very uh, comparable. Uh, the uh, preoperative rupture was a slightly higher in my group versus a control group. So, in a, so essentially, it is a fair comparison. Okay. So, what were the uh, big outcome issues? I mean, based on some of the points we just raised, and we outlined that in a lot in the study as to what are all the points I raised. The big issues we saw a difference in stroke in death rate, in modified Rankin scale, and blood transfusion, which was very big difference uh, based on the techniques we showed you, okay? So essentially what happened in my career, we went from uh, morbidity 6.6% to 4.9% uh, 
in this proposed uh, technique and mortality 1% to uh, half a percent uh, with, with, the, with the points we just raised. So this is gonna be really our analysis of all the points I raised to you so far. Okay, so essentially AVM surgery is safe and it's being conducted by excellent people around the world, okay? It is slowly improving over time in the microsurgical era. These are the largest studies published with more than 100 AVMs in them. Uh, and you see essentially the morbidity is, is, uh, is acceptable for AVMs because, you know, despite what the Aruba trial says, I mean, when you're looking at a morbidity and mortality that comes down, uh, I think that's very important uh, to look at. The final point I want to raise, uh, as we have some students on this talk, is that uh, the Dandy Society has these medical student clubs around the world. I just showed you two students who presented a major study at the ENS. These are clubs around the world. Ecuador is right here. And uh, Dr. Byron is working with me. We need a medical student club uh, for Ecuador. And plus, we're working on the rest of the world. And that's very important. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, I just want to show you this slide. If there are any students from countries who want to join this, please contact, uh, Michaela from Germany or Soleil from, uh, from Lebanon to, to develop, uh, your club. And this is their uh, contact information here on Instagram. Anyway, so I think I, okay, I think I stuck to my time. Uh, maybe I moved too fast because I was worried I'm going to run out of time. Uh, but it has been a pleasure for me to, to speak with you, to share with you some of my ideas, some of the lessons I have learned. And, uh, you know, and we stand on the shoulders of giants, okay? Uh, you know, uh, I have, I'm very fortunate that I trained uh, with some amazing people. And evolving neurosurgery comes from that uh, principle. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. Yes, yes, go on. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Abdul Rauf. Uh, I think that was a, a master class, a uh, very didactic, uh, excellent uh, videos, and of course, an impeccable technique. Uh, I think uh, we are about to, to begin our discussion. Uh, one of the things that uh, for us, young neurosurgeons, that have in mind before getting into AVM surgery is to have a game plan. So I noticed that you present a lot of uh, cases and I was wondering, uh, what's your game plan for these situations? Do you use any scales? Uh, for example, Spetler martin Spetler pons or the modified Lotton scale? Uh, what would you do in those cases? What scales do you use? Oh, for sure. I rely on all those scales. We look at them, we dissect them, because those people spent a lot of time thinking about those scales, and they give us a lot of uh, information, okay? So in general, uh, I, do not, uh, I do not think getting operating on AVMs that are greater four and five should be taken as an easy decision. It is a, it's a, it's a decision of exclusion, okay? So these deep feeders that I showed you, or the, D, uh, or the D, uh, deep veins that are going into the ventricle really just add a very high risk situation. So what I try to show you the way I was talking, every case is so individual. And I showed you a few cases in which I had to make that decision. There are tons of other cases that I didn't operate on that look like that, okay? That when you are forced in a young patient who has bled more than once, then you are facing a very difficult situation. And those are the cases I wanted to show you, right? To, because I operated on them. But there are a lot more cases I didn't operate on than the ones I operated on, okay? So the, this, this is not an easy decision. And it's partially is dependent on the experience of the surgeon. Some of the cases I showed you, like the big cases uh, the, in the brainstem or that giant uh, ABM, I would not have done that early in my career, I'll be honest with you. So there is a learning curve and a very steep learning curve that comes with this. So you have to calculate all those things. So now, some of them are not tangible on a scale, okay? Because you have to bring in your own experience tech, uh, and abilities into your decision. 
It's not just based on some scale that, so yeah, it's a combination of the scales and your personal abilities uh, that the decision has to be made on. All right. Thank you, Professor. Professor Salim, your lecture has been wonderful. You have taught us with very exciting and difficult cases. Uh, of course, to do this surgery, you have to be a master like yourself. Uh, talking about our residents and young neurosurgeons, it is obvious that they have to manage first in, uh, the anatomy. Yeah. They have to uh, a perfect knowledge of the anatomy and they have to study before the surgery. And uh, I would like you to ask you if you can show us what is your protocol of study of all this kind of under, uh, un uh, arterial venous malformations? Thank you, Professor, for your kind words. Uh, uh, mean a lot to me coming from you as a senior neurosurgeon that you are. I respect you so much. Uh, you know, I really believe, uh, you know, I started my whole career and I spent a lot of time with Professor Rotner and I lectured together a lot. So I learned a lot from him. I think if you really don't understand of the, the anatomy of the AVM you're operating on, you should not operate on that AVM. If you do not have a three-dimensional three understanding of that AVM in your head before you go into the operating room, you should never perform that surgery because this, uh, you know, this is uh, this is the kind of work that can get you into a lot of trouble. Even what may look like a simple AVM it can get you in a lot of trouble from a complication standpoint. Okay, I develop a three-dimensional view in my head of the AVM, its location. Is it, am I gonna see it on the surface or is it gonna be subcortical? If it's deeper AVM, I develop a plan, how I'm gonna get to the AVM, what are the trajectories, what are the risks and benefits of every trajectory? Then I really study the, of course, the vascular anatomy of the AVM. I decide early on which feeders I wanna take early, which late, and which surface of the AVM I wanna work in before. I decide this before the surgery, by the way. Because to decide on the spot, you have very limited view, you may not be making the right decision. So instead of the vision you're seeing under the microscope guiding you, you have already three-dimensionally understood the AVM before you had that small exposure. So those are important things. And why I have you, Professor Salazar, I wanna show you a picture of the two uh, masters the two people who taught me, the two masters of AVM surgery. Right next to me is Professor Yashigal, and all of you know him. And next to him is Professor Gus Malik, who taught me during my residency. I believe personally, uh, there probably, uh, there is no deeper experience in AVM surgery than these two guys in the world, okay? So I'm very lucky, you know, I mean, uh, there are young guys that are listening to this and residents. I'm, I learned from giants and I developed my techniques, not because I'm so smart, because I learned from great people, okay? So, so utilize your professors in the best way you can and advance your own techniques uh, over time. Uh, but that is a very, uh, very uh, deep question, Professor Salazar, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Salim. Uh, we have here uh, Professor Juan Luis Gomez Amador from Mexico. Uh, he would be so kind to comment for us. Hello, Dr. Salazar. Thank you very much. Professor Salim on the roof, this is just outstanding. Outstanding lecture. We are looking at the master surgeon. And as you said before, you have very clear concepts about the anatomy and also the tridimensional image in your, in your brain when you are dealing with a with a case. Uh, I, I must say that this is just a, a tiny part of your great work, uh, as, as uh, maybe some of us uh, are aware of your work uh, dealing with aneurysm surgery in the, uh, with the patient awake, and so many other procedures as a bypass that the Dr. Salazar mentioned in the beginning. So I, I think you are opening our eyes. And this is because uh, we learn from the giants, as you said before, Professor Yashargi, Almefti, Roton, etc. But uh, later on, you develop your own technique. And now, now you are sharing this knowledge with, with us. 
So this is a, this is a, a great gift for for the neurosurgical community, and also uh, I want to congratulate you for the, the great work you are doing in the Walter Dandy and Neurosurgical Society, and I, I think this is, this has been a great night. Uh, I I would like to to ask you if possible. Uh, a lot of people is not familiar with the with the surrounding technique with the patient. So you you take care a lot of a patient. And you you are dealing uh, each step of the surgery with the certainty that your patient is okay. So uh, for that, uh, I, I I assume you have a great uh, uh, neuroanesthesiologist. So can can you comment us about the technique in general for for doing these very complex uh, surgeries with the awake patient? And thank uh, you very much for the great lecture, uh, Professor Juan uh, Amador. We go back a long way. I have tremendous respect for you. You have uh, evolved uh, neurosurgery in Mexico and beyond. Uh, you know, the work you have done. We go back, uh, 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 you know, we were young and we were watching Professor Yashi go together. So we go back a long way. And I have deep respect for you and uh, the tremendous neurosurgeon that you have become. Thank you for your comments. The, uh, yeah, the, the, the awake technique, uh, the, the, this was a, an evolution that we did in how we uh, do awake surgeries for aneurysms, ABMs, and bypass. The key issue here is, as you mentioned so well, that you have to have a great anesthesia team. What we learned in this process is that we have to have the patient quite sedated for the opening and the closing, especially some of these operations are very long. And then we have to have a mechanism by which uh, we, uh, we can test the patients in a way. So I. I, I uh, so a lot of these surgeries at the base, you have to really uh, uh, block the dura quite a bit. So that's part of the technique that we have developed as far as uh, the skull base approach is concerned. And as far as the awake aspect of it, you, uh, Professor Amador and others who do so many, uh, you know, tumor surgeries are very familiar with awake surgery for gliomas. I, as a resident, did a lot of glioma surgeries awake. So I just taken that and tried to really expand it to the next level by adding little nuances to it. Thank you, Professor. Thank you we have a question. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we have a question from, uh, from the viewers. Uh, they asked you, Professor, uh, the, that you have a um, you have presented a wonderful and very didactic videos, a uh, lot of congratulations. And they are asking you one of the, let's say young neurosurgeons um, problems during the technique is that they may go into the nidus too soon. They, they you know, they lose the, the plane and it's going to bleed a lot. So what about what's your experience in the commander section of these AVMs or how do you manage this extensive bleeding? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, I see the name, Dr. Juan Miguel Alaman Anguez asking the question. Thank you. The, the whole idea of AVM surgery should be to completely avoid entering the AVM, okay? There's just, that's gotta be a principle that you should never really do not uh, transect inside the AVM early on. Now, there are times you get bleeding from the AVM nidus itself, okay? Because you cannot help it. And the key issue here is, uh, you know, let, let me first, I have seen some surgeons operate on AVMs with loops, not with microscope. That is a big mistake, okay? There is no AVM surgery being done, it should be done with loops. You're gonna get into so much bleeding, all kinds of problems. So you got to take this stepwise approach. And if you have a three-dimensional understanding of the ABM in your head, and you know how the large vein can lead you to it, then you know exactly not to get inside the ABM. Now, in the situations where you get, uh, uh, get into the ABM nidus, don't try to bipolar inside the ABM. That is not going to stop the bleeding. You can keep bipolar and you're going to tear more vessels. That's what's going to happen, okay? As you, uh, the, it's very soft inside. So if you keep bipolaring inside it, you're going to be tearing more vessels. It's going to bleed more and more and more. 
So essentially, once you start get bleeding, if it's a direct vessel, a vein or an artery, you can isolate it. You should bipolar that. If it's not, I would just say you just try to very quickly with cottonoid, just pack it and gel form and just sit tight. Sit tight. You do not rush. Sit tight, sit tight, sit tight. Now, there are multiple different things can happen, and let's go through those scenarios. You sit tight. You got your gel foam, your, your surgery cell on it, and it's, now you're irrigating, it's not bleeding. Leave that area alone. Do not go back into that area. Now you go around, start working around the ABM. Do not go back and, you know, you, the habit is to go back and look at it. I would not. Okay, block it out, out of your mind. Okay? Keep working. Now, if you got this, uh, this thing controlled that way, that's great. Let's imagine worse scenarios. You got in the AVM, you, you know, you don't know how it happened, and it's bleeding like crazy. You keep packing, you keep packing. It's not, it's, it really is bleeding. It's not allowing you to work around it and you see some swelling in the surrounding brain. Okay, do not mess with it. At that point, keep packing it, close, close. If there is some brain swelling, of, of course you leave a large bone flap out, okay? Uh, if no brain swelling, but you're not comfortable with the anatomy, you don't know what's going on, you need to stop, rewire, come back in another day in a better situation. There is no cowboy approach uh, in, in ABM surgery, okay? So there's no way. Now, of course, if it's a tiny ABM and it's bleeding, you can go around it very quickly. But if you're talking about larger ABM, do not get your ego get in the way. You pack it, you stop the bleeding, and now you cannot figure out where the nidus is, where the feeders are. You say, okay, I'm just going to go anyway. Not a good idea especially if you got some swelling around it. I would wait, I would wait and come back another day, okay? So those are some of the lessons that I can, uh, uh, you know, use in answering that question, Dr. Juan. Excellent your response, uh, Dr. Salim. Uh, we have several young neurosurgeons um, who are very surprised for this excellent technique. You have reminded us some of the main steps for ABM resection. The first one you took as it was about a good exposure. We, we cannot do a small craniotomies. We cannot work in a hole. Uh, we have to expose. Uh, you have drilled some of the parts of the cranial base to expose the arteries and veins in a good manner. Um, then you talk us about the subarachnoid dissection and you told us not to go directly to the bottom or to the main nidus of the ABM. And also you talked to us about the feeding arteries that you do not take the, all the feeding arteries at first, but you leave some of them so you can handle better uh, the small arteries or the perforators which are lying inside or the bottom of them. And also uh, one tip that I consider very important was how to treat the primary vein, draining vein. You told us that uh, you wait one or more minutes with bipolar pressing it to see what happens if there is brain swelling or is bleeding. And if you are quite comfortable with, with your observation, then you can take it out and, and clip it and, and close it. And uh, that is very, very useful for us. Um, also, it was very um, important to know uh, not to perform partial treatments, partial resections, because there is a, the risk they are going to bleed later, they are going to increase in size, they are going to be more troublesome to operate. Um, so it's very important, the bonification that you perform and also you have told us about some regions that you are not willing to do surgery, like the thalamic region, the brainstem region. Of course, um, there's a, a step by a step learning process. So uh, we are very grateful with your learning and process and your teachings. Thank you, Professor. Professor Salazar, you, uh, you summarize uh, the key points far better than I can. So you really, dissected really the biggest lessons that all the 
young neurosurgeons and residents need to know about AVMs. You really just outlined them in a beautiful way right there. So thank you for that. Uh, we have here Professor Ive Sharon, if he wanna uh, make a comment uh, or share us with his experience in this uh, AVM surgery. Professor Ibe. Hello, can you, can you, can you hear me? Hi, I, yes, yes, we can hear you. Hey, Salim. Of course, Salim is a master surgeon and uh, he's got excellent experience with AVMs. And uh, I just, uh, I, we had a really uh, bad case the day before. We had a huge tumor, sphenopetro cavernous tumor. In fact, the whole cavernous sinus was involved and then we went ahead and took it out. Um, my residents were doing half the job then I had to go in, we had to get into the cavernous sinus on each triangles and take it out. Uh, but then the patient went into DIC and then we had uh, trouble. So, uh, but we pulled him out. He's completely okay now. So the last uh, one and a half days was spent doing that. He was 80 years old. So we had to be very, very careful. So it turned out to be a carcinoma of some sort. We have to figure what is it. Our life is like that. I thought I knew about uh, the webcast and uh, I put an alarm, but uh, I guess I overslept it because- It's so early. What time is it for you, I in India right now? Well, it's 7.34. Okay. I, went, I went to sleep at uh, maybe 3.30. Yesterday night, the whole night, I hadn't slept for one hour even. So uh, it was my whole team. We were trying to get this guy out somehow. Well, but I'm happy. He, that patient had the right surgeon to take care of him during a difficult situation. I, okay. Uh, yeah, we, we thank God. So everything is okay. Yeah. Yeah. And about AVMs, um, you know, over the last 15 years, we were operating um, in Nepal. Most of these AVMs, uh, they, those uh, AVMs which nobody wanted to operate used to come to us. And uh, our experience is very simple. What we do is, of course, as Salim said, we do extensive pile resection first. And the way the AVM opens up after extensive pile resection on the AVM is it's remarkable, which means what was just like a flat surface becomes like a rocky, big surface. I mean, we, it, the AVM comes out of the surface really. And that's the first thing that you do. You open up all the pia arachnoid around and on the AVM, around the AVM, literally. That's the first thing. And after that, we keep it very simple. We don't get into the nidus. We keep about a one millimeter to 0.5 millimeter, depending on the eloquence, we keep that around. So we don't get into the AVM and you just go circumferentially. So this is what we do. So. When we started doing that, the normal breakthrough, the breakthrough bleeding, which we had, it considerably decreased. So this is gliotic brain around the AVM. It's gliotic brain and the vessels very close to the AVM are fragile, so they tend to bleed. But about a millimeter away from the AVM, it's not fragile. So we bipolar that, cut it and go around. And one of the things we always see that is the AVM has choroidal supply and this is dangerous. So, and this is in the depth. So once you turn, once you go into the surface about, uh, let us say from six o'clock to 12 o'clock, if I have access, I go, I turn, turn the AVM and get the choroidal supply. And after I get the choroidal supply, I dissect around. So what we normally notice is few things. One is, where is the veins? Is there a superficial vein or a deep vein? That should not be taken. We use ICG 800 for this, but it is not there. There were times when we didn't have this ICG uh, before. The vein is uh, not easy. The veins are usually big and they are very they are superficial. You can you can kind of I'm I'm talking from a young surgeon's point of view. They are generally much, much bigger than the arteries, much, much bigger. So 
If you have a very big uh, uh, vessel, you can put a clip, an aneurysm clip and wait. As Salim said, the brain is swelling. That means it's not, if the AVM is swelling, okay, you will know that the AVM becomes much more turgid. And if it's becoming turgid after two or three minutes, then you know that you have not taken the right vessel. So you take off the clip and things get better again. So after that, you start dissecting all around and you turn the AVM and then you go from back from six o'clock to 12 o'clock on the other side. And then you have the AVM. And I also don't follow Spetzla Martin classification. Uh, I only follow if the AVM nidus is compact or not compact. Not compact AVM nidus is a disaster. They, whether they are small, whether they are large, if the non-compact, which means it's a diffuse AVM, this is our experience. If it's diffuse AVM, then going into the thalamus or brainstem or anywhere is a disaster. Even in the motor cortex is a disaster. But if it's a compact AVM, if the size, if it is Spetzler Martin grade five, <clears throat> we have no problems. We have this thing, we have reported this, and I'm sure if you type excision of grade five AVMs, you will get our reports. We have not had any time, much time to publish one, one of these has been published. But if it is large and if it is compact, we found that there is, this is rather easy. This is, um, you know, we, you can go take it out. But if it's a diffuse AVM where the nidus is very, very diffuse, then you go take it out, there will be deficits. And they generally don't bleed much. So this is, uh, again, I am not going by published material. This is our experience in maybe over 200 AVMs. So <clears throat> this is what I can say. You have us with us for one year. And uh, he seemed to agree with, because we were operating together. He has extensive experience in AVMs. And he seemed to agree with this. And uh, we were trying, initially he was uh, not, but then we started, um, we, because we were operating alternate and we started showing him that this is how we do it. And he started, exp uh, he now completely agrees with it. I have to publish it sometime, but I don't think there's anything different from what uh, Salim has said. And uh, I would be happy to hear Salim's and anybody's comments on this. Uh, I have excellent points. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. One of the things that I want to mention from the, you know, points that I've mentioned is uh, to the young neurosurgeons, don't fall behind in, in difficult AVM surgeries. What happens if you're getting bleeding from the AVM, it's already a problem. The second problem that can happen, you could get into a DIC if you have too much bleeding happening, disseminated into vascular coagulation. Okay. If you're getting bleeding and uh, you are, uh, you are, uh, is that your daughter, right? Yes, yes, it's my daughter. <laughs> hi. 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 Uh, so if you start getting bleeding, be very cognizant. I always talk about a concept of having the 60,000 foot view. The 60,000 foot view is this you're in the middle of surgery and you're looking under the microscope and you're seeing whatever good or bad things are happening. You are so zoomed in, you have no idea of the larger picture, okay? That is where you can get into major problems. 60,000 foot view, you have a view of the whole situation in the operating room, including the patient, how he's doing on vital sign, the anesthesia, and including the larger perspective of all the vessels around you, not just this tight, you're seeing this bleeding on the microscope and you're reacting to it. You got to have the larger view, the 60,000 foot view. If you're getting a lot of bleeding, you got to communicate with the anesthesiologist. You may preemptively want to get give FFP or platelets. It's a lot easier to prevent DIC than to deal with it once it happens, okay? So if that's happening, you got to just say, okay, listen guys, you know what? They say, oh, the platelets are okay. I mean, you know, they're a good member. They were before surgery. So I understand, I'm concerned there's some bleeding happening. I'm concerned we could get into an irreversible situation. Please give the patient FFP and platelets now because I'm concerned what's happening here. 
if you can prevent DIC, you will be a lot better off that once you get into DIC, it's too late. Okay, it's too late. You cannot stop any bleeding, right? So these are the lessons that, uh, you know, all of us have been through these things, okay? I mean, you know, none of, us, none of us is perfect, okay? All of us had problems, okay? There is no neurosurgeon who uh, does AVM surgery who has not had problems. I've seen it in the hands of the biggest names I just mentioned, and I've seen it in my own hands. But what's important that we share these lessons with you so you don't repeat the same things. And that's what's important here is that for you to know these elegant lessons that the professors are sharing so that you can prevent uh, this idea. I mean, you know, and so the combination of Professor Salazar and Professor Sherian just mentioned, there are a lot of good points here, okay? And I think uh, that those are what need to be followed. And Mauricio Guerrero from Paraguay just sent a message here, okay, in South America, uh, we do not have technologically developed, uh, well, Mauricio, AVM surgery does not need a lot of technology, okay? It's the simplest, I mean, most things I do are really, this is not neuro-oncology development and, uh, you know, uh, Juan knows. In neuro-oncology, there's all kinds of new protocols and cutting edge. But in microsurgery for aneurysms, AVMs, you have, you're using two hands, uh, a bipolar suction or a suction and micro scissors, okay? That's about the technology that you need, and you may need some clips, and you need a good microscope. For most of these cases, you really don't necessarily need image guidance, okay? Unless it's a deep-seated lesion, yes, you need image guidance, don't hurt the patient. But for surface AVMs, there is not a lot of technology. So the lessons we're sharing here today are technical points. It's understanding the lesion, the understanding the technique, how to become a better surgeon, and how to develop these things. So you are not behind in any way as far as technology is concerned, okay? You just need to evolve your experience, learning from those who have done so much already and getting, I mean, I built, I was, I was uh, living on the foundation of two amazing men I just mentioned to you, uh, Yashir Gal and Malik. So I was exposed to a lot of stuff and I've seen everything that I liked and I've seen things that I developed my own. You should do the same. You should keep evolving the specialty. So that's the idea. And it's, uh, this has been a great session. I mean, you know, it, it's been really enjoyable, you know, being with you guys. Uh, Byron, you, you've done an amazing thing here, you know, really uh, seeing friends and colleagues and uh, speaking with them. Uh, this means a lot. Thank you so much. Professor Salina, you are right. This has been an excellent and very stimulating lecture. Sure. We have uh, attendees from several parts of the world. Uh, we have Professor Takashi Kong from Tokyo, Japan. He would like to say hello. Please. Some comments for, for you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, a wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm Dr. Takashi Kong from Tokyo, Japan, Showa University. Um, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a neuro oncologist and the neurosurgeon about the glioma surgery. And I'm very few experience about the AVM surgery, but I was overwhelmed of the technique and, and management of um, the AVM surgery. Uh, I learned a lot. And uh, thanks to the comments and the IP. Uh, apps comments are very informative comments. And uh, I attend the uh, international meeting uh, so often to learn uh, more thing, more to study. Uh, so uh, please uh, uh, keep me informed uh, for the great lecture. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Byron Salazar and Dr. Javier Salazar. Uh, bienvenidos to uh, uh, Hap Tokyo, Japan. Thank you. Gracious. Thank you, Professor Takashi. Thank you for your kind comments. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you Takashi. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Professor. Uh, I think uh, one last question, I'm sure we wrap up. Uh, in this area, we with uh, endovascular procedures, you know, and uh, once we go past the Aruba trial and all that, uh, how can, uh, uh, how did it change your practice in these AVM surgeries? Nowadays, you know, in most countries, the Latin American countries, we are seeing that most AVMs are getting embolized uh, in hands of neuroradiologists, uh, neurologists, and we sometimes get, you know, all the all the troubles that come with that. So, in your practice, how uh, how's your technique has evolved or changed with these AVMs that are embolized that uh, already have lost their natural um, structure? Uh, how would you change or change your strategy with those? 
Uh, Byron, that's a very good question. And I think uh, you know, there are a number of points that need to be made about this. Uh, there should never be embolization of AVM except part of a team for the cure of the AVM. So any idea that somebody out there should be just embolizing the AVM that they saw is a mistake. It is a disservice to that patient. Uh, I have so many of these cases that I come to me after intermittent embolizations. They make the AVM so much more difficult to deal with. So there should never be embolization without a team approach to how to ultimately cure the AVM. If the embolization, there are few AVMs that can be cured with uh, embolization, very few, but that should be done in hands of people who know that's a goal. But uh, it should never be as part of, uh, you know, this is not diabetes, you know, we're not trying to treat a chronic disease. It's either you cure it or not, okay? Uh, part of the issue with AVMs, with embolization, it is potentially you can increase the risk of the hemorrhage because you're rerouting the flow to vessels that don't have as thick of walls. Suddenly the blood is rerouting. And there is no, uh, there is no study that shows that uh, a smaller AVM has a less risk of bleeding than larger AVM. This is not like aneurysms. So by changing the configuration of the AVM, you're not decreasing the risk of the hemorrhage of the AVM. So these, uh, all our colleagues need to be educated in the management of AVM. It should be in a team approach with the whole team deciding what should be done. Embolization should only be done as part of the microsurgery procedure in time when before the surgery should be done. Uh, th there are a few AVMs, small AVMs that can be cured, single pedicle AVMs that can be cured with embolization and experienced people can do that and that's great. Okay. So, so the timing of the embolization is so critical to the uh, surgery itself. If you uh, embolize an AVM for me six months ago and I'm operating tomorrow, that can create a huge problem for me because it will create these new perforating vessels that are gonna be a problem. So the embolization of the ABM has to be in a very temporal timing before the surgery. I admit the patient to the hospital. I will do the embolization, like uh, I will do the embolization Monday, Wednesday, operate on Friday, if there are two embolizations. As far as which ABMs need embolization, that is a decision that really a surgeon has to make. My as you get better as a surgeon, I'm embolizing less AVMs before I operate on them. Okay, it's just uh, it's it just uh, you know it's a curve that changes with time, because you're adding the risk of embolization plus of the surgery for the patient. So it's not like uh, you know one time deal. Or, no, for the patient, you are the doctor. Whatever happens in that treatment, you are responsible. So I have to add the risk of the embolization to the risk of the surgery I'm going to do. For me, whichever that total totality of that risk is, I need to decrease it. If I'm concerned that the embolization may add a risk that is added to my surgery and I can do the surgery without the embolization, I'm gonna do it. So when embolization is done for an AVM, I'm in the angio suite. I tell them which vessels, see if, if an AVM is there and they embolize the large surface vessels and the big vessels underneath are still there, how did that help my surgery? It actually made it even worse. So just to check mark all oh, we did embolization, that doesn't help me. So if it's an AVM that got ACA, MCA, and PCA supply, and I'm coming laterally, I'm only interested in the PCA embolization. I have zero interest in embolizing anything on the MCA because that's first higher risk with embolization to go inside the MCA. And secondly, it doesn't help me in surgery. So again, as Professor Salazar said, everything is a plan. Everything has to be planned out for the patient with the team. Uh, you know, so this concept of just haphazardly embolizing things, it's really dangerous. It's not good for the patient. And I hope we educate our colleagues who are non-neurosurgeons, radiologists and neurologists who are involved in this around the world now. They need to, you know, they did not grow up learning how to treat AVM patients. You know, we sometimes forget we spent six, seven years of residency dealing with AVM patients. We know... These guys learned embolization, but they have never treated these patients. They have no idea in general about what the natural history is of these AVMs and these patients. So they cannot be made in charge of taking care of these patients. You are in charge. You are the, there can only be one captain in one patient, okay? That, and you get the opinions of all the good people around you. And ultimately the goal is to do the best for the patient, not an ego issue. Well, I'm a surgeon. No, no, no. 
you got to get the best opinions of the best people, okay? If there's something that can be done that can help, that's great. And I would recommend to younger neurosurgeons, if you're dealing with a larger AVM, I would do embolization if it's safe enough before you do the surgery, okay? Don't say, oh, no, no. So there's no cowboy attitude here. You've got to do the right thing, but within a plan. So uh, thank you, Byron, for that. I would like to say something on this. Um, I feel that embolization and surgery should be two different things. I mean, those who embolize, I don't have anything to judge them, but I don't, I don't like my, my AVMs embolized. It's very simple because first thing first, I go, I go to the next step only after complete hemostasis is achieved. So I am very, very slow. So I don't like a single point of bleeding. If it's from the dura, if it's from anywhere, I don't go to, I settle that first. So people think that there's a little loose from there. Let's go to the next step. It doesn't work in AVM surgery. That is the first thing. So you have to be absolutely, absolutely patient. And you can use two millimeter bipolars to 0.3 millimeters. But this, this is very important. Uh, this is one thing I keep. And these bipolars are only for my AVMs. So they should be silver coated. If you have a bipolar which, uh, which will stick to a vessel, this is a disaster in AVM. So you have to have non-stick silver coated bipolars from 0.3 or 0.2 millimeter to two millimeter, big bipolars, okay? So you should have all this connected also. You should have bipolar machines, two or three bipolar machines, and you should not, there should not be time to change these bipolars. So you should give whatever bipolar I ask for, I should get it. And you should go every single, every single step should be, uh, you know, clean. There should not be any bleeding in AVM surgery. If you have a little bit of bleeding and you proceed, this is disaster because you suddenly lose track. This is one thing. Second thing, when you embolize an AVM, you are making it stiff so you cannot dissect and move the AVM. So this becomes very difficult. So because you're going into the depth and this AVM is an embolized piece, then to get into the choroidal vessels is like you have to really pull the AVM, you know, it's like a tumor then, it becomes like a tumor. And like a tumor, you cannot take it piecemeal. So in a tumor, you can decompress and make it piecemeal dissection, and you can get into the bottom. But in an AVM, you cannot do that. So I don't like my AVMs embolized. I go for all the surface vessels. I bipolar all of them. I cut all of them. And once I have a plane from the AVM, from the surrounding brain, I can easily, and once half of the supply is taken off, I can easily retract it so that I get a few millimeters of plane between the AVM and the brain. So this is very important. This is how I get into the deep depth. So what uh, um, I completely agree to what Salim said. I... I don't go for, I, I don't like it embolized because embolization complete, it's not a concept that embolization completely takes off all the bleeding, it's wrong. Embolization just turns it into a tumor. So, um, I mean, with my operating technique, with how I go, I, I completely hate it when the, I mean, I mean, the AVM is embolized. Fortunately, we didn't have much of those in uh, Nepal because embolization was not big in Nepal, but in India, uh, it is big. So people are claiming that they can uh, cure uh, an AVMs with embolization. I don't know much about that. So, I mean, if they cure, they should not come to us. That is all I can say. If they cure, they should cure. And, uh, you know, they should be keeping it with them. Whatever follow up and whatever happens, they should keep it keeping with them. I mean, I prefer that they don't embolize. They embolize and send it to them. Send it to me. That is all I have to say. Uh, I, if you make uh, excellent points, you know, I, if you're an uh, excellent surgeon and you have your uh, stand, I just want to make sure that young neurosurgeons, what is the standard in neuros in microsurgery as far as AVMs? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, emboliz Preoperative embolization is part of the standard care of AVMs. Okay. So of course we have some individual neurosurgeons who are very experienced and I, you know, but I just want to make sure that uh, 
pre-operative embolization for larger AVMs. In general, if you look at uh, large series, that decreased the amount of bleeding that happens and so forth. So I think that's the standard of care. That doesn't mean that every AVM has to be preoperative. Some of the AVMs I showed you were embolized, some were not preoperatively, right? Uh, of course, people like IAP are very experienced. They can have their individual you know, way of uh, how they do that uh, with tremendous experience in their belt. But for the young neurosurgeons here, I think the standard of care is that uh, AVMs grade one to three, it really, in my opinion, should be operated microsurgically. And AVMs that are larger uh, ought to be, if you're gonna operate on them, ought to be preoperatively embolized unless the embolization increases the risk, the total risk to the patient. And most uh, grade five, almost all grade five AVMs do not operate on them, okay? I mean, a, you know, I showed you very exceptional cases, just exceptional, exceptional cases. Do not get yourself in those situations, okay? Uh, you know, and uh, I think uh, radio surgery for deep-seated AVMs, for small AVMs of the thalamus, the, uh, the, the basal ganglia, or the brainstem, small AVMs in those locations, uh, in a patient, I think radio surgery is acceptable treatment for that, okay? So you have to understand the armamentarium of neurosurgery includes microsurgery, endovascular treatment, and radio surgery. The mistakes that are being made is bad judgment. It's not those techniques, okay? And that's what we want to make sure that the young people understand. There is a place for each one of those, okay? It's not knowing where to apply them is where the problem is. So I think that's a cumulative, uh, you know, less, I mean, uh, message we want to send to the young neurosurgeons who are watching here today. Thanks, Professor Salim. It has been a rewarding session. Tonight, we have learned a lot about AVM's uh, treatment. Of course, uh, our lecturer is an expert and master uh, handling uh, brain vessels. I have seen him operating on uh, very invasive meningiomas around the carotid artery and dissecting perfectly the arteries for the tumor. And uh, I think uh, if you are accustomed to handling and dissecting blood vessels and performing uh, uh, cerebral revascularization, you are um, with a lot of comfort and experience. I want to show you the book I, I got in <laughs> St. Louis. When we were there at your thank you so much, uh, professor. Thank meeting. you. And uh, um, I would like to thank to all the professors for uh, their assistance and their comments. And some last words from you, Dr. Salim, please. Well, Professor Salazar, uh, thank you for your kind remarks, uh, for your really nicely dissecting AVM surgery for us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have known you these years. It's a pleasure to, when you came and visited, and it's been great. And I want to thank, uh, uh, you know, our colleagues who are here tonight, the professors, all of them, you know, Juan, Amador, Ibe Sherian, Takashi, uh, uh, all the professors that are here tonight and uh, making the remarks. And I, a special thanks to Dr. Byron Salazar for his leadership. Uh, for neurosurgery of Ecuador, and he's also on the global stage. Uh, I think uh, it's great all he's doing uh, for your country and beyond. And special thanks to uh, John Bennett again for his uh, relentless support of neurosurgical education globally. Thank you so much, Professor. I really appreciate uh, those words coming from you. Uh, I would like to thank a lot to Professor Juan Luis Gomez Amador, Professor Ipe. Uh, Professor Takashi Khan and so many others to, to be here with us to share your experience with all of us. We have a lot, uh, a lot of learn, a lot to learn from you. And of course, uh, we are pleased to have you and learn from you. And I would like to thank John Bennett and once again, the Surgical TV for all of their work and sharing these uh, magnificent lectures around the world. And uh, once again, to the SOPEN, uh, the, the students, uh, faculty of Peruvian uh, members who are uh, always uh, giving us their support. And 
Let's have a good night, sleep, <laughs> Professor Ipe. And thank you so much for attending this, this seminar. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Salim, you've recruited a med student from Bolivia. Stephanie, I uh, want you to meet her face to face. Stephanie, could you introduce yourself? Of course. Good night, doctor. Good night, everyone. Dr. Byron Salazar, Jorge Salazar, Dr. from Mexico, Juan Liz, Dr. Takashi Kon, Dr. I. It's very nice to meet you again. And yes, we had already met with Dr. Salim on our first gathering with our team in Bolivia. And we are very excited to be into work. And I think many of them are here as well. And they are very happy to hear from you, Dr. Salim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefani Cole. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. A really nice, a really lecture. nice lecture. Oh, thank Very you. interesting theme and fantastic this dissection. So. Thank you. Amazing group. I really enjoyed this tonight. Amazing group of people. Uh, I say really hello to your daughter from us. Say hello to your daughter from us. Thank you, Salim. It's What's her name? What, what's her name? Her name is Yoko. Dr. Yoko. Kato is the godmother. Of course. Okay. Say hello uh, to Yoko really. from us. Okay. Yes. Yes. I, I, do you want Thank to say something Christ. about Russia, about the Russian conference you're going to do in a couple of hours, or an hour and a half, actually? Oh, yes. Uh, Albert has put together a great group of people, and uh, Albert Sufiano. I mean, I've been visiting his center from 2013 onwards, and this man is like the other stalwarts, like Salim, like others. He's really interested in um, education uh, for the young neurosurgeons. So he's been doing courses for Central Asia, Russia. And from 2013, we've been visiting his center in Tumen, one of the largest centers in the world, one of the most equipped centers in the world. So he's been doing these courses and uh, today again, he's put together another beautiful webinar and I would uh, strongly advise that you guys watch it. Thank you very much. Yeah, there are Louis Borbers there also, Dr. Sufinov. Uh, okay. Louis is Louis is with uh, Louis is doing these courses with uh, Albert. They are uh, excellent, usually excellent skull based courses, which we used to go every year. October or November used to be the time, but with this uh, with this uh, pandemic, they are doing it online. So you should, I would definitely advise you to uh, go watch these courses, learn from it. There are real masters going on ahead and talking about. Uh, things. I mean, today is, I think, intraventricular tumors. Yes. So, Mustafa is also talking, and Dr. Sufinov. There's the lineup, I guess. Perfect, then we will okay, attend this meeting good. also in a few hours. Thank you, thank you so much again, again, again for, for, for everybody. Thank you, thank you. Professor Salim. Thanks, Salim. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Professor that was a good one. That was a good one. Professor webinar. Takashi Kon, nice meeting you. Nice, nice to meet you too. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Takashi, thank you very much. Thank you. See you then. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Well, now he knows your face, Stephanie. Yeah, doctor, we had a meeting yeah, yeah, no, like okay. I think one week ago. And thank oh, you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, you yeah. met him a week ago? You met him a week ago? Um, yes, I think it was um I think maybe two Assume. weeks. It was on November third. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you, doctor. And we are going to have our inaugural lecture maybe on the first week of December, as I told you. Good, very good. Bolivia, Walter Dandy, right? Yeah, we're very excited. And our team is also very excited to begin with good. this new very club. Good. Thank you, Dr. Byron Salazar, as a president of the SENC. He's doing such a great work. Okay, everybody, uh, gotta get ready for Russia. Hope to see you guys you. in about, in about an hour and 20.